come in from the waiting room. Just a couple more. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Lucy Hitt. And on behalf of the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida, pleased to welcome you here today for um, another one of our uh, Strategies for Action series. And this one, we're very lucky today to have a wonderful guest speaker, Dr. Ibu Patel, um, will be speaking to us and, and answering some of your questions regarding the intersection between um, interfaith and racial equity and equality. Um, and before we, we start, I just wanted to remind you all that today's session will be recorded. Um, it'll be available on our website shortly after the session today. You'll be receiving an email about that. And of course, um, throughout the entire program, if there's anything you want to comment on or you have any questions, I, I urge you to type those into the chat box. I'll be monitoring that throughout. And towards the end of the program, um, I'll be sending some of those questions over to Dr. Patel to answer for you um, towards the end of the program. So, Thank you all for being here. Um, and without further ado, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Patel. Um, he is the founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps, a nonprofit organization working to make interfaith cooperation a, a social norm in America. He is a respected leader on national issues of religious diversity, civic engagement, and the intersection of racial equity and interfaith cooperation. He is the author of four books, and actually, right before um, this started, I went to my, my bookshelf to find one of them, Acts of Faith. Um, and he is also um, a recognized speaker at colleges and universities, philanthropic convenings, civic gatherings, both in person and like today, virtually. Um, he has also served on President Obama's inaugural faith council. Uh, Dr. Patel will join us uh, shortly after a brief introductory video. We come from all over the world, carrying our history, our legacies, our stories, our ancestors and practices we've maintained for generations or created ourselves. We are orthodox and secular. We are searching and spiritual. We are black and brown and white and everything in between. We are civically minded. And when we look at what's happening in society, we think maybe we can help. We have faith in our communities, our families, ourselves, and we are inspired by our traditions to imagine an America that is different, an America that is more kind and compassionate and just. We know we can create one, especially when we come together, when we call on our crew, when we gather to work, when the many assemble as one for the betterment of all. Like those who have inspired us, they came from somewhere. They were young people, bridge builders whose visions and traditions compelled them to act. They were brave and outrageous. They did things that had not been done. They led acts of service across lines of difference. Today, interfaith leaders in communities, campuses, and in the streets across the country are engaging in conversations and actions that steer broad cultural change. And it starts with you and your story and your story in conversation with others like you and not like you, a growing understanding of our difference and similarities that broaden our sense of who we are and who we are in connection to others, and what it means to renew the broken promises of our country. Become a bridge builder. America needs you. As Miss Brooks said, we are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here with you. My name is Ibu Patel. I run a Chicago-based national organization called IFYC, and I'm going to be talking about the intersection of interfaith and racial equality uh, for you all at the Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center of Florida. I want to say that uh, just through the folks here, I see some old friends. My friend uh, Pastor Joel Hunter from the days in the Obama administration, my old friend Anna Purna Astley Padnuk, 
who is part of the original conversations around IFYC two decades ago. My friend here in the Midwest, John Eby, who teaches at a wonderful college called Loris, and everybody else uh, who has gathered. I'm thrilled to be with you. Thank you for coming together for uh, for a conversation that that, that has, has gripped the nation and that I'd like to provide a little bit of historical perspective for. So nice to be with you. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is one of my favorite images in American history. This is one of the Selma marches in the middle of 1965. Uh, Adam Sewer of the Atlantic calls uh, the civil rights movement and particularly what happened at Selma, part of the third founding of the United States of America. Uh, uh, the, this work helped to get us closer to achieving the ideals of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution because it helped to expand the inclusiveness of who those ideals pertain to. So here we have some familiar figures, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the great John Lewis, who as a child would preach to his chickens in the backyard uh, over uh, Dr. King's left shoulder there is the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who missed the trains going from Warsaw to Auschwitz by six weeks and came to the United States as a refugee after seeing six million of his co-religionists burned in Hitler's hellfires. And if anybody had a right to focus only on his community, it was the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And instead, Rabbi Heschel made the same decision that the Holocaust Center of Central Florida has made, which is to pay attention to all communities. And he felt that the soul of Judaism was at stake in the civil rights movement. There were Catholic priests, there were nuns who came out of their convents to Martin Selma, Malcolm X preached at Brown Chapel in Selma. Selma was very much an interfaith movement. In fact, civil rights in the United States of America, the movement was an interfaith movement. Martin Luther King Jr., a decade before this in Montgomery, Alabama, when he first comes to national prominence, he is basically applying the lessons of Gandhi's salt march in India to Montgomery, Alabama in the bus boycott. He says that Jesus is his principal inspiration, but Gandhi furnishes the method. And in fact, the role of Gandhi, a Hindu from India, is impossible to overstate in the civil rights movement. When King is a seminary student in his early 20s at Crozier Theological Seminary, he goes to see a great Black intellectual, Mordecai Johnson, the president of Howard University, speak at Friendship House in Philadelphia on the topic of Christian love. And Johnson uses as the example of Christian love in that lecture, the figure of a man who is neither American nor Christian, the great Hindu from India, Mahatma Gandhi he says he is the best embodiment of Jesus in our day and age because he gives a new meaning to Christian nonviolence. So King at that time had understood biblical nonviolence to refer principally to friends and family. It is in his reading of Gandhi as a seminary student that shifts the paradigm towards nonviolence as a general ethic and a social reform technique. It is that ethic that King puts into this first in Montgomery and then continuing through the rest of his life very prominently here in Selma. The fact that Gandhi is a Hindu is not ancillary to this. Gandhi's Hindu convictions were deep. It was from Hinduism that Gandhi gets his view of nonviolence. But interestingly, there was also interfaith influences in Gandhi's life. The term ahimsa, which Gandhi uses frequently, comes actually from the great Indian religion of Jainism. And interestingly, while King gets his understanding of nonviolence from Gandhi's Hinduism, Gandhi gets some of his own understanding from a reading of Christianity, reading the great Russian Christian, Leo Tolstoy reading the Sermon on the Mount when he was a law student in India. I think all of these movements for racial equity, whether it's Hind Swaraj in India or civil rights in the United States have this interfaith engine that we pay too little attention to. And a big part of what I wanna to do today is lift up the power of these interfaith bridges and dynamics, right? 
I will repeat again, and it's a, there's a great image of it in Ava DuVernay's terrific film, Selma, which I would recommend to all of you, is to see the figure of Malcolm X, post-Hudge Malcolm X, coming and preaching in this Christian church, really a sermon about, to use a term from Martin Luther King Jr., a beloved community. My main point here, Selma, this remarkable event for racial equity is an interfaith movement. Civil rights in America, the third founding of the nation, is an interfaith movement from its roots. When John Lewis goes to Nashville to study at a seminary, he studies with a set of people, James Lawson, Diane Nash, who are focusing on Gandhi, right? When Gandhi is developing his theology of nonviolence coming out of Hinduism, he's influenced by Christianity and Jainism. King actually has wonderful language for this. He goes to India in 1959 and he returns having seen Gandhi's interfaith movement. And he says from the pulpit of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, oh God, our gracious heavenly father, we call you this name. We know some call you Allah. We know some call you Brahma. We know some call you Elohim. We know some call you the unmoved mover. That is the second to last line in King's Palm Sunday sermon in 1959, influenced by his time in India. But the last line is an altar call. The last line, King invites people up to the front of the church and says, who will take Jesus as his Lord and Savior today? That is important, especially to my friends like Pastor Joel Hunter because it shows that positive bridges between people from different religions doesn't lead to a dilution of one's own faith. In fact, I like to think of a, a figure like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as having both roots and wings, right? He had deep roots in his Christian tradition and he had wings and influences and friendships with people from other religions. And the more you read King, I think the more you realize is that the more he learned about other religions, the deeper his roots in Christianity grew. And in fact, he developed friendships with Rabbi Heschel, with Malcolm X, in uh, 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 correspondence with the great Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, not in spite of being Christian, but because he was Christian. King had a theology of interfaith cooperation that comes out of his Christian conviction. In my mind, that is central to what interfaith work is all about. Next slide. So now I have to say that very often we understand the civil rights movement as a principally male movement. King, uh, John Lewis, these uh, uh, Jesse Jackson, Ralph Abernethy, Julian Bond, these great male figures often, we have an image of them, but boy, did women play a central and leading role. And so part of what I wanna do is, is to lift up the women who are at the center and the front of the civil rights movement. It was missing from my history. And this past year, 18 months of, of really important racial reckoning, part of what I have done has gone back and reread about the leading female figures of the American civil rights movement. And I wanna bring some of them to your attention right now. So, and, and the role that religion plays in their inspiration. So here's Diane Nash who leads the sit-in movement at, uh, in, in Nashville and was actually uh, something of a tutor to the great John Lewis when he comes to Nashville. She was the senior young person in Nashville at, uh, leading that movement. She's a founding member of SNCC and she talks about SNCC as applied religion. Right? She says that the goal of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was to reconcile, to heal, to rehabilitate, to solve problems rather than to simply gain power over the opposition. We have this view of SNCC sometimes as uh, the aggressive sword to Martin Luther King Jr.'s pacifist shield. But the truth is SNCC very much comes out of a beloved community, Christian ethic, and Diane Nash speaks about this powerfully here. Next slide. Ella Baker, impossible to tell a full history of the civil rights movement without recognizing that she was front and center. In many ways, she is the mother and the midwife of SNCC. It was under her leadership that the first SNCC conference happened. 
She hosts it at her alma mater, Shaw University. She gets the sense that there is this kind of student movement growing. And frankly, she's a little bit frustrated serving as the executive director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was King's organization. So a little bit frustrated about the slowness of that organization and their involvement in this grassroots direct action movement. And so she decides to bring these young people, these students together at her alma mater for the first conference in 1959. John Lewis is there, Diane Nash is there, Marion Barry is there, James Lawson is there. This is very much the new uh, front edge of the civil rights movement at that time. It happens because Ella Baker creates the space for it to happen. And where does Ella Baker come from? she very much comes from the world of Baptist women's organizations in the South. She sees her mother as a leader of this set of organizations. She grows up in their fold. She sees women in charge. And she thinks to herself, coming into the male dominated civil rights movement in the mid to late 1950s, well, if women can be in charge of all of these powerful Baptist organizations in the South that do education work, that do youth work, why can't we be in charge? of civil rights work. And that's precisely the, the, the role that she steps into, uh, carves a space for herself and therefore other people with uh, her kind of midwifing of SNCC. Next slide. The great grassroots organizer, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Again, the influence of religion on the leading female figures of the civil rights movement. Christ was a revol revolutionary person, and that's where I get my strength. Okay? I want us to pay attention to these individuals' race and to their gender and to their religious inspiration. I'm simply putting out in the course of this talk that none of these people get to where they are right, without their religious inspiration. We so often speak of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As a result of this presentation, I want us to be speaking of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. We so often speak about these, the, uh, when we speak of Fannie Lou Hamer or Ella Baker or Diane Nash at all, they are powerful black women and they are, but they are powerful Christian black women. They are powerful faith inspired black women. That cannot be left out. Fannie Lou Hamer has this image of America as a Baptist welcome table, right? What's a, what's, a, what's a welcome table at a Baptist church? It's where individuals bring their best culinary contribution. It's a potluck. And it's only because people bring their best culinary contribution that the whole community feasts. That's how I think about America in this Fannie Lou Hamer sense, right? We're not a melting pot. What a terrible situation if you bring your best dish to a potluck and there's a giant melting machine that, that turns into the same goo that it turns everybody else's best dish. We're a potluck. We bring our best dish and it's celebrated for its distinctiveness. And America is a place where everybody is invited to bring their best dish, their distinctive contribution from their identity from their culture, from their race, from their sexuality, from their ethnicity, from their religion. You bring your distinctive contribution and there are creative combinations that are found and it is a wonderful feast for all. For Fannie Lou Hamer, that idea of America as a potluck nation has a Christian birth. It is a welcome table next to a Baptist church. Next slide. So there is a long history of people from different religions working together for racial equity. Yes, uh, uh, the civil rights movement is the third founding, but it is not the first time that people of color inspired by different religions have worked together for racial equity. And I wanna put this image in front of you right here, right? Because if you, when you see 1773, if you're like me, you think immediately, of 1776 and the European founding of the United States. And those men, imperfect though they were, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, John Adams, you know the lot, right? Imperfect though they were, did important things. Amongst those things was they helped 
to create the mechanisms of the world's first religiously diverse democracy. The Virginia Statute for Human Freedom, the uh, First Amendment, uh, the Benjamin Franklin's building of a hall where he said the pulpit of this hall would be open to, to any preacher of any persuasion if the Mufti of Constantinople was to send a Muslim preacher for us, this pulpit is open to his, to, uh, to, uh, is, is at his service. They did, again, for their blind spots and mistakes and even sins, remarkable things, but they were not the only people who set forth the, the mechanisms of the nation. This church, right, profiled in Henry Louis Gates Jr. magisterial PBS documentary, The Black Church, was a place where Christian and Muslim black slaves came together to build an institution of worship that serves as a site on the Underground Railroad and still stands today. Why do we know that Muslims helped to build this? Because if you visit First African Baptist Church in Savannah, Georgia, there is Arabic script carved into the pews. And can you not feel the chills up and down your spine thinking of these slaves finding their freedom spiritually, psychologically, and finally physically, praying from the Bible, doing the Muslim Salah in Arabic, in English, perhaps in indigenous African languages in this institution that they built. This also is an American founding. This also is the architecture of an interfaith nation. As we tell the story of the European founders, and I continue to hold, it is an important story. These stories also of the first African Baptist church have to be told, right? The Underground Railroad, those earlier movements for racial equity and freedom, that was an interfaith movement as well. How do we know that? Because at least a quarter of the Africans ripped off the west coast of Africa and enslaved were Muslim, praying la ilaha illallah Muhammad abduhu rasulullah on slave ships crossing the Atlantic. They were the ones working with their Christian brothers and sisters in the fields and in the building of these institutions, which become the architecture ultimately of their freedom. Right? This also is an American story. This also is an American interfaith movement. This also is an American founding. Next slide. So here is the great Jane Addams. And if I had to name one hero that I would personally hold up uh, in American history of, of, of the person who I think is the, the least is known about, and, the, and, and did the, had the most impact on the nation, it, it was Jane Addams. So she dreams as a little girl, what she calls a cathedral of humanity, but she doesn't just dream it, she builds it in the form of an institution called Hull House, which is about five miles south of where I sit right now on the near west side of Chicago. And Hull House is a place, a physical concrete place whose big idea is that the recent immigrant and the poor have as much to contribute to American democracy as American democracy will invest in them. And so she builds an institution that has youth groups and kindergarten classes and a cooking school and a, a crafts workshop where people from all different backgrounds are working together. She calls it the fellowship of the deed. And because she has seen some examples of this in Europe, she insists that Protestants, Catholics, and Jews work together. She is a part of uh, Ida B. B. Wells' movement in Chicago towards racial equality. She is a founding member of the NAACP. She is huge in the anti-war movement in, during World War I, starts the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, is an important part of, uh, of the broader women's movement, it is, it, 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 you can quite easily trace virtually every civic innovation and an awful lot of social movements to not only Jane Addams' imagination, but to the physical institution that she built. And I think about this, uh, in Daniel Allen, the great uh, uh, democratic theorist at Harvard says, 
says ideals get instantiated in institutions, right? So the Holocaust Center for, for Central Florida is an institution that instantiates a set of ideals about education against bigotry, education for cooperation, et cetera, et cetera. Jane Addams does that in the late 19th and early 20th century. And one of the things that inspires me the most about her was how young she was when she started her work. She's in her late 20s. And so IFYC, the organization that I lead, we do a lot of work on college campuses with college students and, and uh, young adults in their 20s. And we talk often about how Jane Addams acquired a set of ideals during her childhood and student years. And then she took her 20s to actually build an institution to those ideals, right? In so many ways, the idea of America as a Judeo-Christian nation comes from the institution that Jane Addams builds where she insists that people from different ethnic and religious backgrounds are gonna work together. And that in that working together, it improves both the work and it improves the relationships between people. Right? She calls it the fellowship of the deed, the ability to find an activity that brings people from different backgrounds together so their relationships can be improved and that the work is a, and that the work is better for it. Next slide. And here is probably the iconic individual who did more than anybody to, uh, 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 to inspire people in the late 20th and early 21st century and actually has a role in, in, in bringing me into interfaith work. So I was at the Parliament of the World's Religions in Cape Town, South Africa in uh, December of 1999. And Nelson Mandela does one of the keynote addresses and he begins his talk by pointing out to the Cape towards Robben Island where he had spent 27 years of his life. And he says, I would still be on that island. I would still be in prison if it was not for the Muslims and the Jews, the Christians and the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Baha'is, the African traditionalists, the secular humanists of South Africa working together against the apartheid. And, and it occurs to me at that moment that the struggle against apartheid in South Africa is an interfaith movement just like civil rights in the United States is an interfaith movement, just like Hind Swaraj in India was an interfaith movement, just like the building of the Underground Railroad was an interfaith enterprise, just like Hull House was an interfaith movement, right? There is this dynamic behind so many of the things that we find important and inspiring. People from different religions building bridges and working towards common humanistic aims. And for me, Mandela saying, I would still be there if it wasn't for this partnership, this cooperation, this interfaith work together, the ability of people from different religions to have common ideals, to build bridges, and to work together to achieve those common ideals. Next slide. And here is Mandela with maybe the most uh, um, iconic interfaith leader of our time, the Dalai Lama, right? And this is in beautiful Cape Town, that's Table Mountain there behind them. But the Dalai Lama uh, has done as much as anybody else over the last 50 years to bring to the front of our minds the partnership between different religions, the possibilities that happen when people from different religions uh, work together for common aims. I had the, uh, the great honor of having a mentor, uh, Brother Wayne Teasdale, who my friend Annapurna will remember well, uh, who was uh, uh, friends with the Dalai Lama. And he arranged a short audience between my friend Kevin Koval and myself and His Holiness in His Holiness's uh, residence in, in Dharamsala, India, back in 1998, when IFYC was nine voices in my head. And I would presented the idea to the Dalai Lama and he laughed and he said, that's a good idea and you should build it. And, you know, alhamdulillah, praise be to God, 23 years later, we are, we are doing exactly that. But I think to myself, if the Dalai Lama doesn't exemplify a kind of interfaith leadership, right? Deep roots in a particular tradition, powerful friendships with people from a range of traditions, uh, an articulation of common ideals, that's the kind of person that we should be holding up as, as a hero uh, across traditions, 
for, for our time, in part precisely because he is so deeply associated with one religion and is able to articulate a set of universal, common humanistic aims coming out of the particularity of, of his particular tradition of, of Tibetan Buddhism. If I could recommend one book uh, by the Dalai Lama to, to you, it would be Toward a True Kinship of Faiths, which is a wonderful articulation of what interfaith work could be. It is a highlighting of of, uh, of commonalities between different religions while having respect for the distinctions uh, um, that, that, that keep the religions in fact separate and, and distinct while still related and cooperative. Next slide. And we see this work today, right? I mean, there is powerful, powerful interfaith work happening today. So I love, I love all of these pictures. I love the picture of of Mennonites for Black Lives. I love the picture of a Muslim and a Jew, uh, each doing their respective prayers, working together at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. That is uh, uh, the picture you see there of the ambulance and the Muslim and the Jewish man. That's from March, April, 2020, right at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, this airport picture of, of a Muslim dad and a Jewish dad with their respective children on their shoulders, uh, welcoming people in, in this case, opposing the Muslim ban and making sure that, that America uh, maintains open arms to people coming in that can be a contribution to the nation. Uh, this is interfaith cooperation happening right now, right? And of course, the Holocaust Center for Central Florida is doing its own version of this. And I'm, I'm really proud to be, to be a part of it today. Uh, but we should be inspired by the interfaith work happening right now the bridging between people from different religions for common humanistic aims. And we should be asking ourselves, how can I be a part of this? And finally, in the uh, next slide, I love this image also, which is this image of, of uh, this, is, this is a vaccination clinic at a mosque that was organized by a couple of young Muslim women in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, there were a set of uh, uh, people at this mosque who had reasonable questions about the vaccine, who were deeply concerned about the virus, but wanted to know in this case, was the vaccine halal? Uh, was the vaccine safe? What could they do if they got it? Uh, a, a whole set of reasonable questions. And these young Muslim women who were part of this mosque and who were in medical school were trusted messengers with uh, a powerful message to the members of their community. The vaccine is safe the vaccine is effective, the vaccine is important. And in fact, they said the vaccine is Islamic because in Islam, we protect our own health and we protect people around us. And that is precisely what the vaccine will do. And this is happening in churches and synagogues and gurdwaras all across the nation. And so often it is organized by young people. And one of the things I wanna highlight here is that uh, my organization, IFYC, and another organization, uh, the Public Religion Research Institute, just released a major survey about religion and the vaccine. And one of the, our findings was that religious messengers and religious messages had a deep well of trust within certain communities. And I think that that's really powerful for all of the, all of the negative stuff said about religion these days. People are still turning to their pastor. People are still turning to fellow congregants. People are still using the, uh, the phone lists and phone trees of mosques and gurdwaras and temples to ask questions about the vaccine, right? Religion is still a repository of trust and goodwill in our society. And I wanna thank everybody who's a part of that on this call. My friend, Pastor Joel Hunter, all of you who are a part of building the trust and the, and the, uh, and the bridges and the bonds that, that is religion at its best. It should not be taken for granted. Uh, it takes an awful lot of work and it serves our society in so many ways. And we're seeing it in, in this particular way right now around vaccination with the power of, of partnerships between faith communities, government leaders and public health officials. So I wanna end with, uh, I wanna end with a video of my friend and colleague, Reverend Jen Bailey. Uh, and, and, and really this video is an invitation, right? Each of us has an interfaith identity story. And in this video where Jen tells her story 
I want you to start thinking about what your story would be. If you were to do a video of your own life, your own interfaith story, what would it look like? So I will end my presentation with Jen's video and I look forward to a conversation with all of you. My first week of high school was 9-11. I remember turning on the news and seeing leaders demonize religious minorities. It hit close to home. Growing up in America with black skin, I knew what it was like to be otherized. Walking with friends who were Muslim, Sikh, Palestinian, Pakistani, and seeing their experience radicalized me as a Christian. I was raised in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, of which I'm now proud and honored to be clergy. In 1787, the white parishioners and leadership of St. George Methodist Episcopal Church would not allow black parishioners to pray. One Sunday, Richard Allen and others kneeled at the altar and were pulled from their knees. They walked out and started what would become the Black Church Movement. The Black Church, as we know it, began as a protest movement against racial injustice. In 2015, I spoke from the pulpit of another AME church, Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama, on the 50th anniversary of the voting rights marches, where the young people of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, were on the ground organizing. So many of them were deeply rooted in their Christian faith and inspired by teachings from a wide range of the world's religions. I stood where the photo was taken of the great religious leaders of different faiths coming together to push for racial justice. And I realized that Selma was an interfaith movement. It's one point in a larger story of interfaith cooperation for racial justice that goes back to Gandhi's Satyagraha movement in India and forward to the struggle against apartheid in South Africa and today's Black Lives Matter movement. I have a mentor who says that Black women have never wanted a vision of liberation that wasn't inclusive of everybody. My interfaith racial justice story is wrapped up in the aspiration to see America live into its promise, to fully be a space regardless of who you come from or where you come from, that you belong. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Really, really appreciate uh, getting us thinking um, in a bunch of different different areas. And actually, I can see this as the chat box has been filling up also with a lot of direct messages um, to me with questions for you. Would you mind um, answering, addressing some of these questions and comments? I, I will answer the easy ones. Okay, you let me know, you let me know. Um, but also wanted to, to tell you as well, because you probably didn't have a chance to see that we have people joining from all over, um, including um, some middle school classes that a teacher shared that she is having her, her entire class watch right now. Um, we have people um, in Nigeria, as well as uh, an interfaith association in Edinburgh, who has great respect for your work. So. Uh, thank you all around from uh, international. Thank you. Um, some of the questions that were coming in, though. Um, first, actually, just very quickly, one of the first pictures there was um, of a march, and there was a question as to which march that photo is from, and that's from either Chan Meng Menglani. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, yeah, that was that was one of the Selma marches from 1965. That was coming in as you were talking and I didn't want to, to interrupt you. Yep. Um, and then uh, a question from John Ebby or Eby uh, says, what suggestions do you have for responding to the concern amongst some diversity leaders that interfaith work distracts from the urgent focus on racial and LGBTQ equity? People respect the historical role of interfaith, but often do not connect it to our present moment and also do not see it as having the priority of the racial equity issues we have right now. Yeah, John, it's, uh, it's uh, um, great to be with you if on Zoom uh, this way. I think the last time we were together, it was, uh, it was, or the last time we interacted, it was in person. I much prefer in person, but of course this question is hugely important. So, you know, I think that there is, as you know, Jen Bailey articulates, she's, she is uh, uh, very much a leader in Black Lives Matter 
And she has this powerful faith and interfaith story to that, to that position of leadership uh, uh, and to that engagement. And, and I, I think to ask the question, you know, where uh, is the powerful inter interfaith dynamic in, in Black Lives Matter work? Uh, uh, I think is I think is hugely important, and it's certainly present. And and frankly, um, when so many people miss the interfaith dimension of civil rights and of Hind Swaraj and of the struggle in South Africa, and so part of what I, part of my purpose in highlighting the interfaith dimension of those movements is to suggest that there are probably significant interfaith dimensions to important social movements of our own time, whether that's the movement to address climate change or the movement for black lives. And so hopefully it, 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 it gives us new eyes to ask a different set of questions of current movements, even if, even if the interfaith dimensions aren't in the headlines all the time. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to compile some questions because some are, are along the same um, or similar vein. Um, this one comes from Josh Bell. It is so good to hear Dr. Patel again. I would love to hear his thoughts on the intersection of religious interfaith work with movements for LGBTQ plus inclusion. Polly Murray, uh, Bayard R uh, Rustin, Audre Lorde, Barbara Johnson are all key LGBTQ figures in the civil rights movement. And there have been other questions also along the line of um, how to do interfaith work when um, some people have very different beliefs and values on who is valued in human rights movements. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, um, I'm both familiar with and deeply inspired, especially by the work of Audre Lorde and Bayard Rustin and, uh, and Pauli Murray. And it's impossible to tell the story of the civil rights movement without the contributions of Bayard Rustin and Pauli Murray, right? Bayard Rustin organizes the March on Washington. Pauli Murray uh, uh, helps, uh, if, you, if you see the great film on Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you see Pauli Murray doing a kind of a mock trial serving as a judge uh, as a, in a mock trial with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and you get the sense that, boy, Pauli Murray's theories were not just deeply relevant to, to racial issues, but also to, uh, to gender issues and helped to shape how Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a Supreme Court justice and as, a, as an activist attorney before that addressed those issues. And these are huge, huge contributions. And, and it just, it seems to me that it would be both sad and, and not smart to erect barriers that excluded such contributions. And so that's, that's, that's why I think a potluck nation is such an important metaphor because you don't want to exclude the contributions of, of people based on their identity, right? Not only is it a violation of their dignity, but you don't get to enjoy their dish. And our nation is stronger for the contributions of Pauli Murray and Baird Rustin, stronger for the poetry and writing of Audre Lorde and and we ought to we ought to uh, we ought to welcome that, and we ought to learn about the identity journeys that brought them to to where they were, right? And and their their sexuality was a part of that. Can you actually tell us a little bit about how you go about doing that in the work of Interfaith Youth Corps, how working um, with college students across the nation, how you are um, recognizing recognizing those different aspects of identity in interfaith. Yeah, so so a, a lot of what we do at IFYC is we encourage uh, students to start interfaith service and dialogue projects. Uh, and if you find a common activity that brings people together, it's a great, first of all, it's, it's important to be engaged in that activity, often a service activity. And it's a great uh, uh, table at which to begin uh, a, a conversation. And so actually this is very much the Habitat for Humanity or Hull House model, right? Again, Jane, Jane Adams' notion of the fellowship of the deed, uh, Habitat for Humanities, uh, uh, notion of the theology of the hammer. Millard Fuller founds Habitat for Humanity, not just because of his concern about, about the lack of housing, but also because he was continuously frustrated that his mainline Christian and evangelical Christian friends couldn't have couldn't have constructive conversations with each other about religion. And he realized that they would do service together and service is actually a language of religion. So why not bring mainline and evangelical Christians together to do service? IFYC's big idea is basically 
a version of that. You should bring atheists or Zoroastrians and Sunnis and Shias and Sufis and Salafis and, uh, and Buddhists and Baha'is and evangelicals and Orthodox Jews together around service and then ask the question, what inspires you to serve? And that's the first question that, that can get you then into a bigger conversation, which includes, tell me more about your story, right? So for us, it is typically uh, um, uh, create an activity or a space where people can engage in, in a project that, that the vast majority of people would agree on, like building a house, right? Um, start the conversation by saying, what inspires you from your identity to serve others? And then basically ask, tell me more about your story. And so you're starting what we call a mutually enriching conversation rather than a mutually exclusive conversation. And incidentally, when you run into an area of disagreement, expect it, right? I mean, did, did you really think that diversity was just the differences you liked? It's not. Expect the disagreement, but don't start there. Don't start there. Start with an area of, of not just agreement, but an area of positive, constructive, common action. People on this on this Zoom are experts at this. You know, John Eby <laughs> happens to be uh, a front and center on my on my Zoom screen right here. Maybe that's God's work. But he has been doing this for for over a decade at, at at Loris College, right? So people on this, and you all are experts at this. Is the Holocaust Center? You know, in in your answer, you know, you were talking about. Uh, different faith groups, but you also, you know, mentioned with bringing people together for some of that, that common good, um, mentioning people that may identify as atheists or humanist, and I've received quite a few questions um, regarding that as well, one of them being from um, Stoic Dan, a question for Ibu, in this changing landscape, how can we further interfaith work with young adults who are secular thinkers and humanists? In my discussion groups in Orlando, we find reading pivotal works for example, Viktor Frankl, uh, are very encouraging and promote civil discourse. Um, so your thoughts on that? Um, it's a powerful model. I, I love it, you know. Uh, um, uh, and and, and it, so there you have, you have a common book, which people are reading together, which you can ask a question like, what inspires you about this book, right? And how does that connect with your identity? And then tell me more about your story. So, so, so often it's beginning with some kind of common endeavor. Uh, you know, we love service projects at IFYC, um, uh, but books, books are, books are, you know, are, are a terrific one as well. And, and your first asking, the first question you're asking is a question that, that recognizes commonality and that invites people's particular story as it, uh, or identity as it connects to the commonality. What inspires you about this book? What inspires you to serve others, right? And 99.9% and, and .9 of the time, the, the, uh, the thing that Sally says does not take away anything from the thing that Salima says, right? Everybody gets to state what inspires them. And in fact, what inspires one person can, can in fact kind of be a rolling ball that helps inspire the next person. The way, the way we think about this kind of at the theoretical level is how do you create a space where it is easier for people to cooperate? You know, one of my great heroes, Dorothy Day, or the founder of the Catholic Worker would say, my goal is to create a space where it is easier for people to be good, right? So, so a slight permutation of that, how do you create a space where it is easier for people to cooperate? Every single one of us knows, you know, uh, what, what question can you ask that's going to start an argument? So we should give ourselves the opposite challenge. What can, hmm. question can you ask that's going to lead to a mutually enriching conversation where people can learn something about each other while not pretending that everything is the same? You know, the idea of the, the common read um, and the discussion, it's interesting because that's actually how I got introduced to your work, Dr. Patel. Uh, when I worked at Rollins College, uh, our wonderful director and, and one of my mentors, Majbin Rafidin, uh, wanted to bring students together over interfaith dialogue and um, uh, interfaith uh, living space. And so that's actually why I, I have your book here is because we used it as um, a common read to begin that dialogue of what we wanted um, 
as a community, what we were looking to accomplish. And we use that as a starting point to have that discussion. So wonderful ideas all Makes around. Makes me so happy. <laughs> um, we do have uh, time for a few more questions. Um, Christine Modi is one of the things I struggle with as a new interfaith leader concerned with social justice is how to navigate responsibility of Christianity for white supremacy in America and around the world, even as we hold up the beauty and hope of interfaith cooperation towards racial justice. How can we acknowledge the Christian hegemony in interfaith work while at the same time working toward racial justice? Yeah, um, I mean, I pre that, that's, a comp that's a complicated question, right? Uh, so, you know, one of my best friends is a guy named Robert P. Jones, who wrote the book, White Too Long. Um, and and uh, that might be, that's one of the, you know, it's a, it's a really focused book in, in recognizing the intertwining of, uh, of some of the theology of your, of yesteryear and white supremacy. It's just, it's inextricable. And it, it has to be faced, right? And actually, uh, um, it's not just the United States. I mean, apartheid in in South Africa was the was the creation of people schooled in theology in the Netherlands, right? It, it's literally a system that was erected by theologians. Uh, Christ, that understanding of Christianity was inextricable from uh, from from white supremacy and, and it, it has to be faced and has to be reckoned with. Having said that, I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it is not useful to me um, for people in interfaith spaces to spend a ton of time uh, talking about the hegemony of Christianity in part because I'm a brown Muslim guy and I lead the largest interfaith organization in the Western hemisphere. So part of me is like, you know, your hegemony didn't stop me. So maybe it's not as powerful as you think it is, right? And so part of, part of what I'm saying is um, things need to be faced and reckoned with, but, but I don't want those things to take up so much room that they crowd out other people's stories. And you'll note, that the stories that I tell of Fannie Lou Hamer, of Ella Baker, of John Lewis, of Diane Nash, of Jane Addams, right? These are people who are people of color. They're women, uh, religious minorities like the Dalai Lama who have uh, built an architecture to their ideals, right? And so um, how do we face things and reckon with hard things without constantly having them crowd out other stories. Because if all we ever talk about is Christian hegemony, then the Jews and the Muslims and the Jains and the Buddhists and the atheists don't get to tell their story. And I have a question from Christina Khan that was actually a uh, just second in by uh, another person in the chat. So they, they really want this question to be asked. Um, many people, especially the younger generations, don't necessarily identify with a faith community and are more spiritual than religious. What role do you see for us in this interfaith movement? Yeah, so you have a story, you have an identity. And, and when I think the power of starting with a concrete common activity, like a service project or a book group, and being asked the question, what inspires you uh, to serve um, or what, ins what inspires you about this book is you get to connect your identity and your story to that book or to that activity. And, and just like Jen Bailey, I mean, one of the reasons I love showing that video is because she does this beautiful telling of her story um, and how it goes back in time, right? to her parents and the aunties in her church and to Richard Allen. And so part of what Jen is doing is saying, here's me as a high school student. Here's me at Selma. By the way, I'm embedded in this larger and deeper history. And I didn't know all of this from the jump. I had to learn about this, but it actually gives me strength to think that this bridge in Selma 
is made special because of people who went before me and I'm, I'm a part of their story. And it gives me strength to think that I'm a part of this community called the African Methodist Church because of this leader named Richard Allen who, uh, who believed that he had, the, had as much right and dignity to, to be at the altar as anybody else, right? And so what I would say is tell your story connect your identity to the activity, connect your identity to other people and ask the question, what, what larger story am I a part of, right? What larger story am I a part of? And, and faith might be a part of that in some ways that inspire you. And, and I only say that as an invitation. I only say that as an invitation, right? Uh, um, because it is your choice what to do with that, that history and that past. But but it, there might be strength in just knowing about it. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I love watching Henry Louis Gates Jr. and PBS, you know, tell people about their, about where they come from and their ancestors. And you see these like major, uh, major American figures, you know, like break down weeping, knowing that their, their ancestry, you know, includes Native Americans in Oklahoma, horrible things happen to those Native Americans, but their great, 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 great grandmother survived, right? Uh, it's powerful knowing a little bit about your history and the energies at play in that history. And, and that's, you know, as Cornell West says, that's wind at your back and it's an invitation. You know, I think that's why I, I connect so much to the work that you do, Dr. Patel, as well as the work that we do um, at the Holocaust Center, because it's all rooted in storytelling, right? It's all rooted in experience, the sharing of that experience, all on, on our own terms, of course, as you said, right? It's our stories and we can do it as we please. But um, I found nothing better at bringing people together in understanding similarities and difference um, than with, with this root of storytelling. Um, and we are, we are almost out of time, but I wanted to make sure to, to get to at least one last question. Um, Marcia Goodwin says, thank you, Dr. Patel, for this historic, powerful interfaith presentation. How do you recommend that we apply the interfaith lessons and approach of the past to address the racial injustices, hate crimes, and police brutality that we're experiencing across our nation now? How do we use the past to learn from for today? So I would say, first of all, so thank you for that question. Um, I would say, first of all, uh, pay attention to where it already exists, right? Uh, just because it's not in the headlines, just because it's not on every banner, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And one of the reasons I love showing that first Selma image is because, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's the priest with the collar and, and the, the nun in full habit, right? But there's a similar spiritual energy. And so it kind of announces this, this religious presence. I think there's similar energies present in the movements of today, but they're not as explicit. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. Just pay attention to where they do, right? Pay attention to uh, the prayers that people might be saying before Black Lives Matter marches, or the, the rhetoric that's happening at, at the too many funerals that take place these days, uh, um, uh, it's powerful spiritual rhetoric. And I, I, think that, I think that paying attention to where it already exists is, is important. And I, and I think that the, the work of a Dr. King or a Nelson Mandela or a Diane Nash or a Fannie Lou Hamer is so relevant today. And one of the ways I think of that is in the metaphor of the welcome table at the Baptist church, right? How do we see America as that welcome table that welcomes the contributions of a range of people? And the only way that the community feasts is if everybody gets to contribute. And so those images from the past, I think are very much relevant today. How do we kind of uh, uh, build them, our mental muscles to see those positive pictures from the past in the movements of today. Thank you so much. There was so much in this program. I think that even I will want to reflect on it more and watch again. And so please remember that um, if anyone's interested, you are more than welcome to watch the recording of this or share it with those that weren't able to be here today. Um, we will be sending out an email to each and every one of you here 
um, with that information, as well as a feedback survey. Um, and we hope you can, you know, participate in other programs in the future. But Dr. Patel, I really wanted to thank you. Something that I'm going to, one thing that I wrote down that I really am walking away with too is you said it so briefly and it stuck with me though, is this notion of roots and wings, right? Being rooted in, in who I am and my own belief system, but having those beautiful wings to be able to outreach to others and, and learn new things and see new perspectives. So thank you very much for being here today. Um, everyone, thank you for participating in so many questions. I apologize we didn't even get to them all, um, but please do read some of the books that Dr. Patel suggested and watch the video again. Um, also, please know that programs like these are free and open to everyone in our community, but they wouldn't happen without our, our generous donors. So please consider if you'd like to support any of our future programming, there will be a link in the chat box as well as in the email. Um, we would love to be able to keep providing wonderful programming like this. And with that, just to let you know, we have another program coming up. Our next one is an In My Own Words um, series with Judith Rapp Hera, and that will be on May 12th at 12 p.m. So again, thank you all for attending. Dr. Patel, I can't wait to collaborate more on future programs. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going, thank everyone, you so much. Yes, and everyone at the Interfaith Youth Tour, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye, friends. Thank you.